it's like Okay, it's getting to 4 p.m. We can wait a few more minutes. Okay, a few more minutes and then we're good to go.
Okay, I'm gonna start our webinar. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce myself. First of all, hello and good afternoon. Thank you so much for investing your time with us on this beautiful Monday afternoon. Um, it is a great honor and pleasure for me to represent the Pacific Northwest College of Art, as we call it PNCA, at this year's Virtual Design Week Portland event. Um, this panel disc discussion is being hosted by Design at PNCA. Um, design at PNCA is a few different things, BFA in graphic design, BFA illustration, MA in design systems, MA MFA in collaborative design, and a lot more things. You'll have to go to the website to check it out. Um, I am Homera Tasneem. Um, I am an Indian with, I was born and raised in Dubai, and I'm currently pursuing a master's in design systems in PNCA. I have a background in architecture and I'm also an artist. So yeah, that's me. I also wanted to emphasize that this panel is about taking risks and I am taking a risk today myself by moderating this panel. It's something I've never done before. So please be patient with me. Um, today, we have an amazing panel on the right to fail risk plus reward in building creative culture. That's the title of our panel. And this is where we'll be talking about taking risks and reward in the creative process. Our goal today is that whatever your role in this industry, th that you'll come away with something like a new idea, a fresh perspective or a new strategy that you can apply to be more successful in your life. Um, so before we go ahead, here are a few questions to think about. When was the last time you took a risk? big or small. Maybe you decided to try a new dinner recipe today and you were scared it wouldn't work out. Maybe something different. Think about that risk. Think about what resources you had in, in case the risk turned into a failure. What, do you, what would you have been able to get back up and try again? Did you have the resources? Did you have extra food for dinner if, in case the recipe that you tried out failed? These are something, some questions that I would like you to keep thinking about throughout this discussion. Here's the format, um, just to give you a brief overview, we'll be taking a few moments to you know, introduce each of the panelists and then um, we'll kick off the conversation. I have a lot of questions planned to ask them. Uh, and then in the end, we'll keep the floor open for you all to ask the questions. So uh, on the right corner on your screen, there's a question and answer thing that you can just, uh, write down your questions on and we'll keep looking at them. Um, before I talk about the panelists, I wanted to mention that this panel discussion could not have been possible without the support of the amazing Megan Gilgin and Kristen Ro Roger Brown, who are currently working at PNCA. They are amazing faculty and they've been very helpful throughout the whole process. So let's get to the panelists. This year we have three panelists, as you can see on your screen here. Um, they, they all have unique perspectives and, you know, to the idea of risk taking, and they all come from different backgrounds and perspectives. We have Bijan Beh Behrami, the owner of Fisk and teaches graphic design at PNCA. We have Katie Augsburger of Future Work Design and Ju Young Oh, who is currently working at Multnomah Idea Lab and teaches at the Collaborative Design and Design Systems Department. So we would love it if you could give us a brief introduction about yourself so the audience can know you better. Um, please introduce yourself with your race, ethnicity, and pronouns. Thank you. Thank you, Kamara, for having me. Uh, my name is Bijan. Uh, I go by he, him. And uh, my, pa my parents moved here from Iran in the 1970s. So I'm Iranian American. I grew up in Los Angeles, outside of Los Angeles. And I went to Cal Arts, which is a design school in LA. And I moved mm -hmm. to Portland uh, seven years ago. And I operate a graphic design studio, an art gallery, and publisher called Fisk and here in Portland, Northeast Portland. And I also teach in the graphic design program at PNCA. Great. Thanks, Kimara. And thanks, PNCA. I am Katie Augsburg. I use she, her pronouns. I racially identify as black and have been mostly in rural areas my whole life of Oregon, but have been in Portland since 2000. Um, I'm one of the founding partners of Future Work Design and we are a consultancy that are, is really focused on helping organizations 
center equity in their strategy, org design, and employment practices. And I do employment practices because I have an HR background. Hi, everybody. My name is Shu Young. I am a Korean and with a little bit of Japanese and an immigrant. Um, it's been about 20 years of being here in the States. And I wear many hats. Um, I also teach a PSA um, collaborative design program. And um, I'm a design and strategy consultant. And recently, I joined Multanima County Ideal Lab where I um, bring my experience in design thinking for racial equity and systemic change. Um, I'm also a process work therapist and work mainly with um, Asian Pacific Islander clients. Thanks for having me here today. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so let's get on with this. I will give you a brief introduction of what today is going to be like. So um, fail harder is tattooed on the hearts and walls of many designers. Mistakes are central to the design process and to learning in general, but risking failure represents unique challenges when seen through each of our individual lenses. Who is and who is not allowed to take risks? That's the most important question to ask. How can we create a culture of experimentation and trust that truly empowers people to take risks, make mistakes and come out the other side stronger? What I understand personally from risk is that the whole idea is to be comfortable being uncomfortable. For me, risk is more about being patient and trusting the process. Uh, this cultural moment puts the idea of risk in the spotlight in multiple ways, in terms of health, wellness, the ways we stay connected, social justice and liberation. We cannot ignore how creativity and risk is impacted at these intersections. So to start off, I had um, more of a general question, like what is risk to you? Who is and who is not allowed to take risk? And that's pretty much whoever wants to go ahead and answer that first. I'll start. Um, I think it's interesting when you use the word allowed, because I think all of us are allowed to take risk. I think the cost of risk is much greater for um, folks of color, folks whose identities are on the margin. Um, I, when, when we talk about that fail harder, I think we have an expectation for some folks, particularly white, particularly male, folks from dominant culture, that failure is part of the learning process. And I don't think that that same um, assurance or same uh, grace is given to folks whose identities are in the margins that we're expected to show up fully ready um, and dialed in. And so we may have that same allowance, but I don't think we have the same um, ability to share, to show up that way. I'd like to echo Katie. Um, by the way, like this format, I am so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> it's uh, fascinating because I can't see any of the audience with this like first time that I ever have this mm -hmm. situation speaking. So um, I feel a little warm. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we're in a room talking to each other. So just casual. So uh, maybe, maybe my room is literally warm. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I think, um, you know, what, what is a risk? And when I ask this question, what I was thinking about, what some examples that came to me was not necessarily like, oh, this is a wild idea I'm gonna introduce to a client, but more have to do with the moments that I spoke my mind um, and showing up as my authentic self mm -hmm. and voiced what I felt and what I um, thought. And often I, think, um, I mean, again, like, yes, I, I think uh, people um, marginalize people, BIPOC, and um, um, people with different abilities and you know, mm -hmm. gender identities, um, we have varying degree of comfort in showing up in different places. And um, yes, we are all allowed to take a risk, but the coast will be, will look very different depends on depend, depending on your identity and um, yeah I think uh, um, I would say um, 
if you're listening to this and if you feel comfortable walking into most spaces and speaking speaking your mind freely, um, I would like to recognize. I would like you to recognize that not everybody feel that way. That it is um, privilege, and it's mm -hmm. our systems designed that way. Um, so that recognition is important. Um, so I, I, for me, like a, a risk is really everything. I mean, every day is a risk and it, they contain small ones and big ones. Sometimes they're about relationships or friends. Sometimes they're about work or school. Um, but I think the thing that's made me feel comfortable taking risks um, has been support systems, whether it's family or people that have come before me. Um, like obviously like Katie and Drew Young have said, like POC people are, you know, at a, uh, are not as encouraged to take risks. But I think for me, I always like lean on um, history and people that have come before us. There's always been anomalies of people who have been really brave and done things. And I think risk is for me also has been kind of uh, related to where I'm at in my career. And I think um, a risk at my, when I was 20 versus being 30 right now looks very different. Um, and I think it's risks are very contextual and um, they're so unique to each individual sometimes. Um, and I think this is what Katie and Drew Young are talking about. What a risk is for one person might be completely different for another person. It might be every day, it might not be a risk. It might not even be a possibility. Um, so I think just really being aware that everyone's risk assessment and risk potential is very unique. I think everyone is able mm -hmm. to take risks, but that mm -hmm. spectrum looks different for everyone. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, maybe Katie can get onto this, but what do you think is the difference between risk and taking calculated risk? So there are two types of risks that you can take that I've learned um, from you as well. So what do you think about that? What, what is the difference and how can you, you know, which, which direction do we go in? Yeah, um, well, I've been thinking a lot about calculated risk because when I was asked to be a part of this panel, I was like, I am the mm -hmm. least risky person. <laughs> why would you why would you ask me this? Um, but I realized like from from the outside, maybe the choices I've made in my life might feel risky. Like, you know, I started future work with um my business partners after a divorce. I was a single mom, you know, mm -hmm. like full source of income, like that seemed risky, but in my mind, it was a very calculated risk. And I had really focus on like possible solution A, possible solution B, possible solution C. I had all these different things like literally mapped out of like what are the worst case scenarios um, because I don't have the same social safety net that some other folks have. When we talk about these, this entrepreneurship mind, mm -hmm. those people often have someone to fall back to. And what was clear to me is that I was a social safety net for most of my family, especially as a first person um, in my family to go to college, I'm the social safety net. And so for me, having a risk without thought is foolish, but having a very calculated risk, a really thoughtful, like what are my options and what is those impact and who am I impacting by making a choice? Um, to me is the only kind of risk I can take. So I, after thinking about it, I was like, okay, well maybe I am a person who takes risks but they're not risks without thought. And I think that is some of the calculus that we see people um, based on class, based on race, based on gender making is mm -hmm. that, that you have to be uh, really thoughtful about your impact on those risks. Yeah. And I think, be, be, oh, Julian, go ahead. Thanks, Yumaira. Um, as Kate is speaking, I, I remember watching the video of Steve Jobs' speech and he was mm -hmm. giving inspirational speech um, in front of a group of people, I think graduating students. And he was talking about how um, he took a lot of risk in his life and you know, therefore he became successful and follow your heart, the money will follow, like all these things. I think we need to really look at it with who is speaking. It's, there is a straight white man speaking in a white dominant culture um, and he's not thinking about millions of people who's behind the desk assembling this iPhones and computers 
and they're not thinking about I'm gonna take a risk <laughs> following my heart, you know. Mm -hmm. So again, um, you know, it reminds me of that moment. Like we need to think about who can afford taking a risk. Yeah. Yeah, I think like risk is uh, has maybe like the wrong kind of uh, like I think when people think of the word risk, they think of like it's like a life or death situation or something. And I think like what Katie's saying about like best case, worst case, like that's how I approach risks also is like, what is the best case and worst case scenario? Mm -hmm. um, and obviously like, I'm not, I don't think risk taking risk is like gambling at a casino, you know, like you're not like, you don't have your whole life on the line. I don't think yeah. most of the people that we look at as successful have really taken risks in that way. I haven't, you know, when I look at a risk, it's for instance, me getting, getting the space that I have in Northeast right now, um, that was probably, that was a huge risk for me. Um, it's the biggest space I've ever uh, leased. Um, it was something that was very unknown for me. I didn't know what I was getting into. I didn't know what went into managing a space or rebuilding a space. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember sitting in my car, having the lease paperwork with me and being on the verge of signing or not signing it. And, you know, the worst case scenario was that I lost, you know, rent or I, I lost money mm -hmm. and, it, and it wasn't all of the money I had. It was a portion of the money I had. It would have been hard to come out of that. Um, but I think I just trusted the kind of, it's really, I think like trusting the people around you. I mean, I think that's really what, what at the end of the day um, encouraged me to take a risk like that was that I felt like I had a support system um, mm -hmm. that would help me thrive in that situation to be able to take that risk. But the worst case scenario was was losing some money. Um, and of course that is like relative to whatever money you have, but it wasn't that scary of a risk. And I think the reward definitely outshined the risk. And that's why I took mm -hmm. that. Um, that's why I signed that lease. Yeah, and if I can add on to that, I think, especially Ju Young, when you were saying about Steve Jobs, I think there's this like fetishization and, um, glorification that happens with risk taking in our culture where we are like we are so in love with the story of someone who like threw it all away for like a grand romance or a grand opportunity um and I wonder often how true those stories are like when we actually peel back the surface like how true was it about Steve Jobs? I think that's the narrative and the the, the sexy narrative for all of us to consume but I wonder if that is if there is, if the truth matches the reality. And if it does, it is because of tremendous amount of privilege. But the idea that our culture is so enamored with this idea that one could throw everything away um, on a lark, I think doesn't really match the lived experience of most folks and, is, and actually harms innovation. Because I think innovation is slow. I think taking like starting a business or opening a studio or doing any of these things is slow and it's paperworky and it's spreadsheets and that yeah. is the unsexy work of risk but I think that's the thing that our culture isn't that attracted to we're attracted to like the throwing it all caution to the wind um, but I don't know if that actually matches reality for most folks yeah, I definitely like agree with that I think what I always try to tell, talk to students is like it's baby steps like like really like you have to start taking small risks and eventually you'll get better at taking larger risks. Um, I think that's such an important part. It doesn't all just happen at once, you know, like it takes, takes a lot of time. And I think the sooner you're able to start taking risks that make sense for you. And I think you can start taking risks in school. I think you don't have to, there's no like moment to wait to, I think really risk is just something that, um, I don't know, it's a weird word. I, it's a very dramatic word. And I don't think like I see risk as that dramatic for me. I'm just like, um, they don't seem, I don't know, risk is weird. Yeah, but I think baby steps, it's all about baby steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I can totally relate to that because I'm in school right now and I'm doing my master's and I'm kind of like trying to understand where I can take the, those risks so that they lead me to success. But then I'm also like, oh my God, if I fail, I have to do this all over again, which can be hard. But then again, it's kind of helping me get comfortable with taking risks. So yeah, I can totally relate with that. 
Um, another important question that I think was also asked in the question answer page is, um, is failure and risk a result of white supremacy culture? So that's kind of like the hard, juicy question that I wanted to kind of ask. Um, what support do we need to take more risks in white supremacy culture? And maybe Juyang can get started with this because she was really into, yeah. Talking. yeah um, these are big questions. Mm -hmm. And yes, I do think that it's a language of white supremacy um, perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, it impacts everybody, not just the white folks, but um, white and BIPOC folks. Um, and our creative industries also often driven by productivity, perfectionism, and it breeds competition over collaboration. Even though we talk about an emphasized collaborative, co-creative process, mm -hmm. getting there can look pretty competitive and fierce. Um, and failure, like how do we define failure in, in our creative world? Like it's often, did you meet the deadline? How much profit did you make? Like, you know, these are, if these are the language we're using and forget um, the people, humanity in the process, um, you know, are we measuring failure in the way that we honor people and humanity? Like that's mm -hmm. what comes to my mind. Right. I think what comes up for me when I hear uh, the white supremacy culture and how failure is used is that I think there is a tendency specifically for BIPOC folk that if you fail, you are a failure, which is different, I think, than some of the um, latitude we give white folks that failure is part of innovation, as part of the process. And so I think it becomes a tenement of white culture because it's so married to people's uh, value of that person that like, here's proof that you don't meet my expectations or that you could never be um, part of a team because like this moment of failure is an indication, or this moment mm -hmm. of failing is an indication of you being a failure. And, um, and I don't know, as a person who's never been a white person, mm -hmm. I don't think that that's that experience. I think there's, there is more um, recognition that failure mm -hmm. is part of a process as opposed to a value of who you are. Yeah, for me, I mean, I definitely see like, I think in the way that we're talking about white supremacy culture as like it's directly related to capitalism and i don't really there's not a ton of a there's not a huge difference between those two things i think they're very much associated and i think for me like what i've seen is that like the the connection between those two things and the connection between representation and media is really um probably like the biggest harm to you know, BIPOC communities. And I think we're living in a much better time now where we're able to see uh, black and brown and bi other BIPOC creatives um, and see their voices, whether it's music or art or design through social media, through different platforms. So I think that's been a huge, like um, inspiring thing for me now. I'm really excited about the future um, of the youth and, and what they're uh, being able to witness, you know, like even me growing up in LA, um, there weren't a ton, there, there weren't a ton of, you know, uh, designers who were brown um, or musicians or pop stars, or if they were, their identities weren't, uh, weren't showcased or they weren't proud. Um, so I think we're in a much more exciting time, but I think also, you know, these uh, structures have been created by white people. And I think um, I think we're now realizing that they're all kind of up for the taking and that we can all participate in them, that you know, mm -hmm. a black or brown person can run a business or a design studio or can be a famous pop star or can be a talented artist. Um, I think it's, it's the, the numbers are still um, not very balanced, but I think we're, mm -hmm. we're working towards that. And I think a lot of that comes from representation and kind of control of that representation, which I think is shifting now. And I hope continues the shift. Um, yeah. 
One thing I wonder, um, and the comments, looking at the comments kind of made yeah. me wonder it. And, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering it kind of for the first time. So my apologies if this isn't polished, but I, I wonder if, like when we talk about white supremacy culture and failure, I, when we had the pre, I'll go back, when we had the pre conversation, we talked about like, can we point out a time that we failed and it didn't go well, we didn't have a success story. And I really mm -hmm. couldn't, and other folks on the call couldn't either. And it wasn't because we've never failed and just like had a dumpster fire of a day. It's just that we have reframed all those failures as learning opportunities. And I wonder that if the, if fail would actually be a tenement or failure be a tenement of BIPOC culture at all. Like I, it's, I think it's an important process of what we know of white culture innovation, but I don't know if like, if I could create these systems, a failure would even be a word I would use because I think we expect people to stumble. We expect people to grow and learn. And I think I would just call it growth. And I think we don't, I think, I don't have those stories to tether to of when I failed and didn't recover because failure isn't a tenement of my culture. <laughs> like mm -hmm. growth is a tenement of my culture. And so I just don't have the tools at my disposal to discuss failure in that way. Because mm -hmm. every time it's like, what did I learn? Oh man, I learned never to wear those shoes to this event. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm always learning something from those things. And that to me is just part of growth. It's not a, that's not a failure culture. Yeah, I think what what I would also say is I totally agree with Katie. Like, I don't really relate to the word failure or relate to the word risk even. Like, I don't really, they don't really make sense to me. And I think maybe it's because those words are defined by people who um, have historically had um, easier lives than the minority. And for them, mm -hmm. they have, you know, you have to create a word called risk or failure that um, is out of norm. But for people who have been suppressed their whole lives, like every day is a risk. And every day is maybe a failure or I just I just don't think those words really relate to like to me either. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, and I think um that's a really important thing to point out and something I haven't thought about before. And I think something that's a really uh, exciting idea. Mm -hmm. As you were saying that um this this risk and failure, all these words sound like um wartime words, languages from yeah. military. Why are we using that for our creative process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it's interesting because it's like, this is a brand new thought for me. <laughs> but it is just, it is language that I don't think I use in my house with my child. It's not a language I often use for myself, but I think it's so part of our nomenclature. It's so part of like how we discuss process, how we discuss creative process. But I think for for a lot of folks, that's just the process. It isn't actually a failure or a risk. It's just the growing and learning and doing of whatever the thing is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's like the nature of education and school um, is, uh, you know, is learning. And I think the way that I approach like my practice is, is with like uh, thinking about it like play um, and I think like, I, I, I prefer that word rather than risk. Um, and I really like approach my, my practice in a way where I'm trying different things out all the time and I'm constantly reimagining what the best possible structure is, um, whether it's working with other people on my team or with clients or whether it's the physical space or online presence or the way that I talk on Instagram or all of these things, how I present myself, I think it's just all navigating um, these things and, 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 and at, at the end of the day, um, figuring out what like feels right for you and what you feel most comfortable with and, and most uh, excited about um, and how I think you can best, most accurately represent your, your essence. And I think it, that there's a constant play there. Um, and some, some days it's great and some days it sucks. Um, but I think that's the nature of, of life. And I don't really, yeah need to define them by those those words mm -hmm. man Humaya, you were in my class and i took mm -hmm. that process right? so, yeah design research. Know, design research and what we do is really um create a create a platform for um trying different things iterate on it 
get feedback from people and you don't even start um, coming up with concepts before you talk to people that you are designing for. And then so that you don't start with um, blank canvas, mm -hmm. you create a creative sandbox um, because you know the user now, you know the, their journey. And then you come up with concepts and you put it back and in front of people and get their feedback and you go, you know, over this process over and over again and um, iterate. And there is no such word as failure and risk taking <laughs> in this mm -hmm. process. It's just what we do, right? Like this is what we live and breathe. Yeah. And um, I think Bo asked the question here and I was going to ask that myself, you know, about taking risk in terms of BIPOC people. And, you know, um, especially with Katie, uh, I read one of your quotes and I think I said this before too. It says too often a woman of color will come into an organ organization. People are excited. They say, yay, we've diversified. Then she points out a problem in the office and, you know, the people say, no, you're the problem. And eventually she leaves or she just gets fired. Um, what do you think we can do in terms of that? And I think you've spoken about this in your podcast as well. So maybe you can start, Katie, with you. Yeah, and that's, I think this is where risk, the conversation of risk is um, maybe not applicable because that's oppression, right? When pe people mm -hmm. vocalize how they've been harmed and then they're penalized mm -hmm. for it. That is what an oppressive system looks like. And mm -hmm. so the fact that folks can't show up and challenge and ask questions and be provocative, that to me is, uh, that highlights that there are organizations that are practicing in oppressive systems or, or in white culture systems that are, um, that are not inclusive because that, forces people not to innovate. It forces people to, to kind of put their head down and accept really poor working conditions or poor you know, creative spaces or poor um, health environments. You know, it, it, mm -hmm. it forces people. And that's what, that's what oppression looks like to me. So this kind of divorces the conversation of risk where it's just, we are completely intolerant of anyone being, and it's like, it's kind of hard to use the word provocative because provocative makes it sound like, you're a provocateur or you're doing something that is outside of what is reasonable. Yeah. Asking for what you need is a very reasonable thing, but in some organizations it does feel provocative and that does feel mm -hmm. risky. And that to me is not um, not necessarily what this conversation is because it's like, where do you get to make a risk? This is like, where are you being oppressed? Yeah. And I think um, Vo also mentioned, you know, that, uh, white white or you know cis white men or even females are given more time to be you know forgiven and they're given more grace time whereas BIPOC are not and that is obviously you know a concern for all of us because you know we have to as a student myself I have to go and you know get a job and then this is going to happen to me sometime and then you know, it's the risk, like, should I stay here and, you know, just deal with it or should I move on? But then again, do I have the resources to move on and, you know, find another job? So there are all these big questions that kind of come into play. So thanks Wo, for yeah. asking that question. And, and to further what Wo said about this idea of like looking safe or, or being boring and playing it safe, mm -hmm. I think what is particularly difficult and I'm not part of the creative community in the same way mm -hmm. everyone else is but I, what I've seen as the person who works on employee experience is often we want the we fetishize for lack of a better term the mm -hmm. art the culture the experience of BIPOC folk we want that in our organization because we want um, we want that creativity and that talent but we actually want them to behave like white folk. We want the right. we want the talent, but we want them to assimilate as quickly as possible into the organization. And by we, I don't mean me or anybody on this call, but I mean the culture at large. Is that the goal is to bring that talent in, but for that talent to essentially behave and act as if they are um, white folks. And I think that what that does is really harm 
um, people of color, if they cannot bring their full self to work and they cannot express themselves in their full way, it completely shuts down any ability to be creative. For me, I mean, growing up, my parents, like they both grew up in Iran and they both moved here during the Iranian revolution. And they raised me and my sister in a suburb outside of LA. And they didn't know how to, they didn't, really didn't know how to raise me in the sense uh, of for American culture and how to succeed in American culture. So I think throughout my entire childhood, I always, I didn't identify with the structures that I was participating in, whether that uh, was elementary school or high school, I never felt like I was successful. I didn't identify with um, a lot of the, the students there because I, there was you know maybe one or two or three other Middle Eastern kids at, the, at my schools. And I've, mm -hmm you know, until I graduated, I pretty much felt like a failure because I wasn't successful by my school's standards. Um, and I think it was until I found the school I went to, uh, which was, which is Cal Arts, and it was a very liberal school. It was very diverse. There are people from all over the world there. And I think it really opened my eyes to the kind of people that I felt more comfortable with, which um, are people who don't feel like, uh, or who aren't comfortable or people who um, stand out. And I think mm -hmm. that was a really empowering uh, moment for me. Um, and I think that led to where I'm at today. And I think even after I graduated I, and I got a job at Nike, I still felt like I didn't identify because I was still a minority in that, um, in that company structure. And I think for me personally, I've always thrived in creating my own platforms. And I did, did that when I was in school. And, and that's why I don't work for any, that's why I don't work at a corporation. I work for myself because I feel like it's so hard to participate in these, uh, in the la current corporate ladders or the current art gallery ladders. They're not really nice to to, to mm -hmm. people of color. And I think yeah. it's for me, rather than trying to forcefully change that or, or continuously get rejected from those situations, I've decided to create my own. Um, and I think that's, that's for me been very uh, beneficial because it's allowed me to, um, it's allowed me to find other people who are in similar situations with, as me and identify with a larger group of people who don't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think that is a really powerful way, you know, rather than trying to change Granted, I think we should try to change companies and art galleries, but I also think that there's a lot of power in, you know, uh, BIPOC creatives creating their own platforms and their own ways of functioning, because mm -hmm. even through this conversation, we've identified that we don't identify with the word risk or failure. Um, so, right. you know, if we're trying to participate in these structures where those are the definitions of, of our success, maybe there's something wrong with that formula and maybe, maybe there's space for us to create our own narrative and our own structure and, and that's why for me it's so important for me to create a work environment for the people that I work with that is unique to what is normal um, and I think mm -hmm. for me I encourage as many people to, to create their own communities and their own practices and their own corporations and their own agencies mm -hmm. and their own ways of identifying with other people. Right on Bijan, somebody mm -hmm. says. Yeah, <laughs> I echo that. Um, I'd like to speak about my experience of, um, you know, so working in the creative industry for the last 20 years as an immigrant from Korea, um, I think the first at least 15 years, I tried to conform to what is, what seemed like the best place to be in the eyes of um, immigrants, the white elite designer, you know, European Bauhaus worshiping that class, right? And what hit me really hard about five years ago with my um, beginning of racial awareness journey was that it was not what really harmed me was not necessarily the um, people around me who had this uh, embed uh, unconscious bias around racism and gender and such. But it was um, how I internalized their voice and shamed myself. When I make a mistake, I was very unforgiving. I was very competitive. Um, and it was a lot for me to recover from each incident. And um, when I recognized that, wait a second, um, I am not showing up as myself. 
I am speaking from a voice that could conform into this, the culture of this company I work in, this team that I work mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. um, where is my own voice? And where is my own self-acceptance as I am? Foreigner with a accent, um, you know, who doesn't have Brit British accent or, you know, other European accent that is more welcomed, you know, what, where is my voice? So um, I've been going through this grieving process of, oh, wait a second, it's time for my own voice and my own self to show up as myself. And um, I echo what Bijan says, um, that I, I did go independent and started consulting and it was helpful to also uh, have support system around me like-minded people and I um, have a lot more freedom to show up as myself. And I also um, have to say my team at Multanuma Idea Lab are so supportive and I can show up you know, as myself fully. So it's really important, I think, for a BIPOC folks to find their community where they can be themselves. Right. Um, I think we're going to open the question and answer session now because there are about 15 minutes left. So if the audience wants to add some questions, we can answer them. But before that, maybe um, I can ask you a question. Um, so this was a question about, you know, your younger selves and things. Bijan kind of um, answered that a little bit, but what would you tell your younger selves with respect to taking risks and failure and, you know, um, maybe in the spectrum of, you know, your lives as a BIPOC person and how that helped you or not, especially, you know, for students over here who are still maybe a little young and can, you know, take advice from you. And till then, maybe the audience can start asking questions if you have any. Um, I, I'll answer. I think something that's been coming up for me a lot is how much of my youth and young adulthood um, was really formed by passing, really mm -hmm. trying to just pass in mostly white space, particularly because of where I grew up, um, the kind of communities I was in. Um, when I first started getting my first kind of like real job, being in mostly white space with white executives, and my my goal was just to pass. And um, I spent a lot of my older adulthood really beating myself up for that, um, because it's like, why did I, you know, why was I so passive? Why did I show up in space in that way? Um, but to realize that those are survival techniques, and really um, to give yourself some grace the grace that the world doesn't always give you to allow yourself, like if you have, if you feel like you have to show up in space to pass in a way that like helps you navigate the world, it's okay. If you wanna show up authentically yourself, that's great too. Like whatever the tools that you need to kind of get through um, to whatever it is that you wanna create or be in the world, uh, that's okay. And for us to, I think I would have beat myself up a lot less had I realized that those are just techniques that I was trying to develop and grow and trying to figure myself out in a system that wasn't really built for me or meant for me. You know, as a chubby black woman, there's not a lot of systems in the rural Oregon that are like set up for Katie Augsburger. And I had to kind of do my best. And I think I would have been a lot more kind and compassionate to myself about how I needed to survive those systems. Um, I, I think on the line of compassion and self-acceptance, um, I heard this quote from somebody once, um, love yourself because of the difference, not necessarily mm -hmm. despite of that difference. So really embracing your difference. Um, and you know, for me, myself, like being Asian American has been a, such an identity thing lately. And I love that I am Korean and Japanese mm -hmm. and American. And honestly, I never loved that part of myself more than you know, 
I, I really appreciate that more now than ever before. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, so my advice to myself, um, and this is like what I constantly tell my students is um, to really make uh, the most out of being in school or whatever community you, you're in. Um, I think it's a really special time when you're in this community of like-minded people, especially if it's new for you. And it was for me when I was in school and I really, um, I was so excited to, to feel comfortable for the first time um, with other students. And, and it was a really important uh, period of time for my growth. And I think um, to start these things, these projects or these platforms or these communities um, now, uh, rather than waiting until you feel like you're an adult, I think it's okay to start uh, a project or a program, even when you're not uh, a fourth year or, or, or a senior designer or senior mm -hmm. creative. I think I started Fisk my first year at school. I didn't know how to design, um, but it was just a way of taking advantage of the opportunity that I had and, and that's unique for everyone. Um, but I really think uh, just don't wait for other people to give you these opportunities, create them for yourselves. I think also um, ask people that you admire um, for things, you know, and that could be time or advice or recommendations or references or, you know, sharing stories. I think really ask people for help, especially when you're in kind of the development phase of, of whatever practice you may have. I think it's, it's the responsibility of people who have come before you to help you. And I think you shouldn't feel bad for asking people that you admire for help or for advice or for time or whatever it is. I think um, they we owe you that. So I, I ask people who I uh, admired or was inspired by for help all the time. And more often than not, I was um, surprised that people did give me time. Um, and it's I think it's been really important for me to see people um, kind of offer their time to me. Cool, awesome, thank you for that. That's really helpful because, you know, even for me, like sometimes I get really uncomfortable asking people for advice or just asking them for help, even though I'm pretty sure like, they'll be like, yeah, sure. Or if, even if they say no, like it's not a big deal, but then you always kind of get weird about it. And, you know, so those, um, those, that advice was really good. And um, there's a question here from Reflective Consultation. So um, if you can see it, it says, you see a connection between professional self-reliance, self showing up authentically and the ab ability to love your identity and yourself. So outcome, it's been answered. Um, does anybody want to answer that question? Um, I think <clears throat> I think the goal is that we can all show up authentically ourselves. I think that's mm -hmm. what we're driving towards. I think that looks like true inclusion. Um, that's what uh, the world that I want to see. Um, unfortunately, that is not yet the world that we live in. And I think mm -hmm. that's what's really painful is that we're kind of in this transition period where dominant culture sets the tone, dominant culture holds a lot of the purse strings in organizations, dominant culture um, makes hiring and firing decisions. And if we're not honest about that, we're really setting people up for failure. We have to be honest about the fact that a lot of us do have to code switch in professional space. We have to be honest with the fact that dominant culture sets the tone in organizations and that is very painful and oppressive. But if, but specifically for younger folks coming into um, the business environment particularly, we are not honest as mentors, BIPOC mentors, if we say, yes, you get to fully show up as your authentic self because I've watched people get fired for that. And so it, for me, it's really important to say, I want you to show up in your, as your authentic self. I, I think that is critical. Um, but I want you to also recognize like how you may have to code switch in, in places so that you can be successful. And I think that's just being honest about how power is held in this country right now. I want to add to that. Um, you know, I I want to encourage people to 
also trust their intuition of body when it's not the right time and not the right situation. Um, it's okay that you don't take the risk. Um, yeah, I, I think I want to stress again that I think uh, the idea of risk is very contextual and really depends on where you at, are at in your life in your relationships and your financial status. Um, but to answer that question, for me personally, I do see a connection between those three things. As far as working for myself, um, learning, like Katie said, I think the idea of being authentic is a, is a forever process. And I do think that it does get easier by, by the, as you get older. Um, I think you start to realize things. Um, and, and I think the idea of loving your identity is also a progression. I think I've gone through a lot of waves where I've um, been really interested in learning about uh, my parents' culture um, and and even learning outside of their culture. I think that was a really big moment for me where my entire childhood, my idea of Iran was, uh, was educated. Uh, I was educated by my parents uh, and their experience mm -hmm. specifically. And then it wasn't until a few years ago where I don't know how it came up, but um, someone recommended a book. Um, they found out I was Iranian and they recommended this book, Lipstick Jihad. And I read that book. And in the first few chapters of that book, uh, the author talks about how the same uh, experience I had, her entire idea of Iran was told to her by her parents. And when she was in school, she realized her teacher told her, hey, like, you know, your culture is very interesting. You should do research on it for this project. And she said, oh, I, I'm Iranian and my parents are Iranian. I know and I already know about the culture. And he started recommending books to her. And she realized that there was so much to learn. And I think for me now, I've been reading a lot of books on Iran. I have a way better idea of the environment my parents grew up in. Um, and I'm learning more about my ident identity constantly through reading things and then going back to my parents and asking them questions and realizing that I don't align with them in a lot of ways and that they were taught a certain thing in their country at that time. And it's, um, so I think it's just constantly, it's a work in progress. And I think yeah. um, for me though, I think not being in a corporate structure, if I, if I was in a corporate structure, I wouldn't be able to pursue these things that I'm pursuing right now. Um, mm -hmm. So I think my self happiness or my progression of happiness and my progression of confidence and authentic, being authentic are really attached to my freedom of, of uh, being able to, to work for myself and, and, and do what I, I believe in um, and not be confined by a box um, that has historically been serving a specific kind of person. You know, I don't identify with those people. So why should I operate in this box? Um, and I know that in itself is a privileged thing to say because I'm outside of that box to some extent, um, but I've worked hard to get out of that box and it's been, you know, 30 years of working to get out of it and I'm still working to get out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that answers the question. Um, there's another one in the chat um, from Giselle, which is what are the basic technique or exercises you would recommend to creatives? for achieving or getting to that grieving stage and ultimately, ultimately transform it into freedom. So she's, they've used examples, for example, social media is full of therapy, exercises, articles, but um, from your own personal and professional journey. I think Bizan kind of answered the question. I think okay. we need the racial healing. We need mm -hmm. inter, intergenerational racial healing. Um, mm -hmm. It's, um, you know, the journey looks different for everybody, of course, but myself, um, it um, looked like really going back and learn what it means to be Asian American and in what ways have I been oppressed and in what ways have I been oppressing myself and other people who are BIPOC. Mm -hmm. And that um, also meant history of Asian American immigration, history of Korea, history of Asia, history of um, all kinds of things. I um, ended up taking a trip to Korea, uh, Asia, like Japan, Korea, and uh, Myanmar last year for like nine months to really dig deep. And again, I had the privilege of mm -hmm. <laughs> having the Good. time uh, research to have that journey. 
um, and did research on comfort women topic, uh, sexual so, uh, slavery by J uh, Japanese army during World War II, and um, really seeking some reconciliation. And mm -hmm. these are unique to this, you know, my people and the struggles that um, very unique to our people. And it's barely talked about in the mainstream, you know, American culture. And so, you know, when anti-racism toward Asian Americans look often look like invisibility or permanent foreigner. Um, I, for me, the work of healing is to make myself more visible. And the way to do that is to know my own history mm -hmm. and sharing that um, and grieving that at the same time. Yeah. And then we have um, another question, sorry, from Burton. Uh, do you feel like your fear of failure has translated into something else? And I think this might be going for Bijan, but um, for everyone, yeah. Um, fear of failure translated into something else. Um, I mean, I think it's definitely translated into like my ambition um, and my mm -hmm. curiosity. Uh, I, I also like grew up with my parents aren't your like traditional Iranian American parents, you know, mm -hmm. uh, most of my cousins and most of the Iranian people I know who grew up here, you know, are highly encouraged to be doctors or engineers or lawyers or dentists. Those are like the definitions of success. Mm -hmm. And I've been fortunate enough to have parents who didn't force me to do something. And that's not often the case for first generation right. uh, mm -hmm. immigrants here. So I feel really lucky to have uh, explored art as, as or design as my professional practice. Um, so I, I definitely, I think my fear of failure has translated to my uh, encouragement to succeed. Like I think me failing was not an option because I studied graphic design, you know? Like I think I just, there was no way that I could be like, hey, I'm not gonna be an engineer or a doctor. I'm gonna be a graphic designer and then fail. Like that just was not, it's not an option for me. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think I definitely have used that um, as a force for good in my life. And, and also it's just, you know, it's created a sense of realism for me that I, I, I have to operate within some of the structures that I've been talking poorly upon, you know, that I do need to be able to provide for myself and for my family, mm -hmm. um, that, that money is something that is, uh, is a part of my career and it has to be, um, to be able to, to, to have a sense of comfort for my parents and, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I mean, I think it's really encouraged me to kind of be successful in those um, ways that we define success in America. Um, yeah. Um, so do you all, do you all folks have any closing thoughts? Because I think we're getting to the end of time and that's all the questions we can take. I mean, I have realized that I shouldn't be or failure, it should be growth. And how can I, you know, experience this type of growth in myself when I'm making decisions, I should look at it like, it's not a risk. It's, are you going to grow out of like something out of it? Are you going to learn a lesson? And if that is a yes, then you should go for it. Like for example, this, you know, this panel and moderating, I was kind of like, oh, I've never done this, should I do it? And then I thought, well, I'll grow out of it. And I'll, next time I do a panel, I'll know how to do it because now I've done all this research and understanding how to do it. So yeah, clearly I have learned a lot for sure. But do you guys have, have any, like, do you all have any um, closing questions or closing, um, you know, anything to say statements? Um, I think, I, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think from Homera, your point kind of gave me an aha as like a closing statement for me is that it's, yes, risk is uh, part of our culture. It's part of how we talk about something exciting and new. But I think for me, what is most important is to stay on my learning edge. 
Like, where is that space that I feel kind of uncomfortable where I'm trying something new that is hard and difficult, um, that isn't breaking me, that isn't causing discomfort and stress, but is actually pushing me to do better, work harder, learn new things about myself and the people around me. And I think once I, when I'm on that edge, um, I feel like that's when I do my best work. And that might not necessarily fit cleanly the definition of risk, but for me, that fits cleanly in like definition of growth. Uh, my last remark is that I want to speak for those moments when um, people feel, oh, I failed. I made a big mistake and then really shame, feeling ashamed. Mm -hmm. um, just take a moment and look at it from, you know, who is ashamed in myself? And whose voice is shaming me? You know, what is this internalized voice? You know, you can stem from childhood trauma where you were first ashamed in the culture where it's very critical and your teacher or your parents might have uh, criticized that. And then you internalize that and conveniently or inconveniently, you bring that voice with you everywhere you go and shame yourself as if they are always, your parent is always there with you. Mm. And I, I hope you get them off of your back. Um, my final words, um, I think curiosity is one of the most important practices of my life. And I think I encourage everyone to remain curious. I also think, um, and this is contextual again, but I think don't be fearful of something that hasn't happened yet. Um, and I think I associate that with risk. If, um, you know, I think there's a connection between that curiosity and trying something for the first time and then creating your own um, reaction or your own assessment to that uh, idea of what you thought was a risk. So I think it's, it's really trying to get over that hump of, uh, of being fearful of something and then never trying it. So I think I just encourage everyone to try something once and then learn from it and never do it again or do it all the time. Um, I thought I was stuck. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. And I really hope that all the listeners and, you know, we all as a BIPOC community take this forward into, you know, the organizations that we go with, the friends who are sitting with at the dinner table, you know, have these conversations and kind of, you know, help the people in the world. And yeah, thank you so much for being here. And I think we're going to go off now so thank you to the panelists um we are so glad that you're able to do this with us especially pnca we you know are a community and we really enjoyed this conversation with you so thank you all right thank you thank you bye, bye. Yeah. and you can read some of the um the thank you for sharing and stuff the appreciation on the chat <laughs>